the Biological and, and Toxin Weapons Convention. Uh, my name is James Revel. I'm head of the WMD and Space Security Programs here at UNIDIR, and I'm delighted to be able to moderate this event. I should note before we get any further that this event will be recorded and it will be made available online in the coming days through UNIDIR's website. Um, before proceeding, a little bit of context. It, is, it has been a long and somewhat difficult year for those working on arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation issues. But the year is not yet over and there are, amongst other events, uh, before the, the conclusion of the year will be the ninth BWC Review Conference, which will take place in just a couple of weeks in late November. This uh, is a really important opportunity to be able to take stock of the past and to be able to chart a course for the future of the Biological Weapons Convention at a critical point in which science is advancing and geostrategic relations are currently under strain. In preparation for the review conference, UNIDIR has been working in support of states and stakeholders in their preparations for the review conference and beyond. And we've organized several events and published several reports, which are really intended to stimulate thinking on different aspects of the BWC. We thought that as the first committee is now concluded, it may be useful to actually provide a little bit of a refresher on some of these reports in order to stimulate thinking in advance of the review conference. To do this, we have brought together the authors of four of our recent, recent-ish, I think, Unity Air publications. And what I'm going to ask them all to do is to provide some short sort of pictures or summaries of the key insights and ideas from the reports. And we did so with a view to, for, uh, to providing states parties with some food for thought to consider ahead of the review conference. These papers will cover the topics of verification, advances in science and technology, international cooperation, and potential outcomes of the review conference. But before turning to the presentations, and in a slight change to the schedule, I'm delighted to be able to invite um, Tancredi Francese to provide some opening remarks on behalf of Ambassador Leonardo Bencini. Leonardo Bencini is the permanent representative of Italy to the Conference on Disarmament and the president-designate of the Ninth Review Conference of the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, as many of you will know, Tancredi, who will be speaking, is the Deputy, Deputy Permanent Representative of Italy to the CD, and also importantly served as the Vice Chairperson to the Preparatory Committee earlier this year and late last year. Uh, Tancredi, ap apologies if I mispronounce your name. Thank you for joining us, and the screen is yours, sir. Thank, thank you very much, Jamie. You actually did it very well. So good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to everyone. I'm glad to be here with you, but apologies for Ambassador Bencini. Uh, unfortunately, cannot be with us today because he had a, a small personal emergency. But uh, well, I'll try to, to, to uh, on his behalf, to first of all to thank you, Nidir, for all the work, the great work you are doing uh, uh, on the BWC, not only now uh, at the eve of the review conference, uh, but let's say during the whole re review cycle, all the intersectional process. And even before that, so thank you very much, uh, not only as presidency of the review conference, but really as, as a state party, I believe that your support is very much appreciated. And uh, we have a, a comprehensive, really comprehensive program in front of us for this afternoon, so I will not uh, use much of your time, but just a, a few remarks from our, from our side since the review conference uh, opening approaches. And uh, we believe that the international community needs to invest more resources in the international architecture dealing with biological weapons. And the COVID-19 pandemic has shown how important it is for us to work together to improve uh, global biosafety and biosecurity. And no doubt in this regard, the BWC is of the utmost importance and uh, every possible effort should be made to strengthen its regime and ensure its full and effective implementation. The upcoming review conference represents so a key opportunity for us, for all the state parties, to take stock of the work that we have done during the intercessional period and to build the basis uh, of our collective engagement in the years to come. Well, nevertheless, as you have mentioned, Jamie, it is difficult to ignore the important challenges we have to face since we found ourselves in a situation that is far from being ideal. And uh, I'm convinced that dialogue and flexibility are now more essential than ever. We will need it at the review conference. 
And uh, we as a presidency stand ready to cooperate with all state parties to achieve uh, a common understanding uh, to identifying what could be a strong outcome uh, that will outline very clearly our goals for the next review cycle and identify the most effective way to concretely strengthen the convention. We know that uh, well, the, the work of the BWC has not been easy. And uh, we also know how challenging it is right now to, to come to the review conference uh, with a positive approach, I would say. Nevertheless, we really believe that it's time for us to draw a line on the story of the BWC. We should put an end to reciprocal, reciprocal recrimination about the past and opening a new page for the future of the convention. The Night Review Conference represents, in this sense, an extremely important opportunity. And uh, we, all together, cannot afford the price of, of a failure at the Review Conference. I'm particularly glad to see that today there are more than 160 participants. Uh, uh, I believe this is a very good sign. Uh, well, of course, a sign of the appreciation for the work of UNIDIR but also of the appetite that state parties have uh, to, to come to the review conference and to hopefully agree on some positive results. So I also want to thank all the participants to be here today, and I'm looking forward to, to participating in the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim Curley, for, for your kind words. I, I suspect several points that you've raised will be the subject of discussion. I also share your, your hope that the, the number of participants is, is a sign of an appetite for a positive outcome, but thank you. Um, I now turn to uh, our speakers, and just to provide a bit more context, first of all, the format for this event is going to be a series of short presentations or summaries of around five minutes in length on some of the key ideas from the Unidea reports. I then want to hand the floor to our colleague Daniel Feeks from the Implementation Support Unit um, to raise a couple of points uh, before we enter into a moderated sort of Q&A session. If you would like to ask a question or raise a comment, please, I would encourage you all to do so. Um, you can raise or submit written questions at any time using the Q&A function. Please don't feel you have to wait until the end of the presentations. The questions should only be visible to those to the panelists um, and those of us that are sort of working the production team here. So I will try to get to as many of these questions as we can. Um, one other thing here, if you would like your question to be attributed, please do type your name uh, and institution into the sort of Q&A box as well. Otherwise, we won't attribute questions. So say we'll try to cover as many questions as possible, but we can make no guarantees because we do have very limited time. One final thing to note is that all panelists here are speaking in their personal capacity. Um, and to put it quite frankly, I don't expect everyone to agree with our panelists, but if we can sort of help in stimulating thinking, then I think that could be a value in and of itself. With that in mind, I'll get started. And I'd like to first offer the floor to Richard Lenane. Uh, Richard's uh, formerly an Australian diplomat who was involved in the ad hoc group negotiations and also worked in the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs between 2001 and 2013, including as head of the BWC Implementation Support Unit from its creation in 2007. I'm delighted you've been able to join us, Richard, and you're going to discuss the publication on Back to the Future for verification. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Jamie, and thank you uh, for inviting me to, to speak about uh, this paper. So we've been asked to give uh, a very brief introduction, so I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, first, I'm delighted to see so many of you here in the seminar that's, uh, that really reassures me uh, and that the BWC is in good hands. We wrote this paper, it was me and Jamie Revel and John Borry. What we wanted to do was to take a really step back and, and zoom out and take a look at verification for the BWC from, from basic principles. And we wanted to do that to try and get beyond the kind of, yes, we should have a protocol, no, we shouldn't have a protocol, yes, we should go back to the ad hoc group mandate, no, we shouldn't, this very kind of stale back and forth debate, um, and go into actually what, what would verification mean now, 20, 25, 30 years later? Um, what's changed? What hasn't changed? what would it mean, what kind of tools are there, what kind of new threats, new problems are we dealing with, both technical and scientific uh, opportunities and problems and political and diplomatic ones. So just to take a real survey of the situation, what's happened over the past couple of decades, 
uh, where we are and where we might go. Um, and I think, uh, although I referred to the sort of debate over verification as being a bit stale and repetitive, something we do note in the paper is that the reason, I mean, the fact that this debate has continued for so long really illustrates an important point, and that is that verification and compliance remain a very important topic for states parties, not just for, for one or two states parties, but I think for, for many. And so that's why uh, it's a perennial topic. It keeps coming back. And that's why we, the authors of this paper, think it's worthwhile taking a, a much more in-depth look at it at this review conference, trying to sort of put aside some of the, the rather stale and, and bitter, um, I think Tancredi just called it reciprocal recrimination. That's a, an excellent uh, description. Uh, let's try and put the reciprocal recrimination uh, aside and go back to the, to the beginning. What, what we had um, in the early 90s was the Verex process, looking at possible verification um, approaches from a scientific and technical viewpoint. Uh, obviously, science and technology has moved on a lot since then, and it would really be useful to, to look at what's changed and what's possible now. Also, the biological weapons threat, the possibilities there, new dangers, new, uh, new risks have come out. So it would be good to, to perhaps have a Verex 2. And that's what we're suggesting in the paper is to reconvene some sort of Verex process. There are various formats it could take, um, but to look again from a scientific and technical point of view at, at what could be done. Um, the, uh, the other thing we want to do, I'm just checking my notes briefly, is to is to look. It's not uh, enough to to just look at the scientific and technological side to look at what's possible, technically possible for the verification. Having the best sort of uh, machinery and uh, uh, systems in the world is is fine, but you need the channels for actually raising and responding to compliance concerns. So. Um, it, we can develop all sorts of verification tools, but we also need some sort of system to invoke those and to approve their use and to provide, uh, to, to determine how they're going to operate and to, to say, like, if a state party has a concern, what, what does it do? At the moment, we've seen the, the machinery that's currently available has been used quite recently. We've had a formal consultative meeting. Uh, we've had the Security Council uh, discussing a, a, a non-compliance allegation. So, um, that's quite timely. I know it's obviously very politically uh, controversial, but it's it's good uh, in a in a sense to see these mechanisms being used, and so we can see how they work and see what we might need to do to improve them. So that's two things. First thing, a verex. Second, verex to look at the technical and scientific uh, parts of verification. What could be done? What should be done? Second part is to look at the the channels, the procedures by which we might invoke these uh, these techniques and how the non-compliance allegation would be handled. Uh, and the third thing we're suggesting is to, to create a sort of compliance friendly environment. And that is sort of building up the structures around the, the BWC and the mechanisms available nationally and internationally. Uh, things like improving uh, implementation of Article 7 and Article 10. Uh, these things are all linked. I think this is very important to keep in mind that verification compliance don't sit on their own. It's very much linked to the implementation of Article 10 and Article 7. We need to build capacity. We need to develop better links with um, actors outside the BWC, the World Health Organization, other intergovernmental organizations, the scientific communities, uh, uh, NGOs, civil society, academia, and so on. There's many different aspects there. And we really, I think, to build an effective verification mechanism, we need to look beyond the, the treaty itself and look at the integration with the, the wider community. I think that's five minutes, so I'll, I'll stop right there. Um, please do read the report, or at least the, the summary and the, the conclusions. Uh, and uh, of course, I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Richard. It does indeed seem to be a perennial topic and a difficult one. Uh, it, it's good to see those questions coming into the Q&A. We will get back to those. I noticed there's one on civil society. We will get to it. Um, but before that, though, I'm delighted to introduce Jeremy Littlewood. Uh, Jez is a policy analyst in, in Alberta, Canada, and also a long-standing expert on the Biological Weapons Convention and arms control issues more generally. He's also speaking in his personal capacity. As an expert who has previously worked at Carleton University in Canada with the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the University of Southampton in the UK, and in the United Nations as well. 
Uh, Jess, without further ado, the floor is over to you. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning if you are where I am on Mountain Time. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so my paper um, was really trying to think through at a fairly high level, what are the four possible outcomes of the, of the ninth review conference? And I base or devise these outcomes, I don't think they're that controversial, uh, based on the past experience of what we've done in the previous eight review conferences. So in general terms, you could have a limited outcome, uh, which is where in reality, you don't reach some kind of final agreement uh, at the end of that process. Uh, and you agree to meet at a later date or you pass on specific problematic issues to a later meeting. Uh, you did this in 2001 and 2002, so the fifth review conference, and again at the eighth review conference um, in 2016. The second is what I call the status quo out outcome. Um, this is pretty much as we've done over the last couple of decades, a uh, series of meetings of experts, annual meetings of states parties, so the 6th, the 7th, and ultimately the 8th by the meeting of states parties in 2017 uh, divides the intersectional programs. A third possible outcome is what I'm generally calling a new approach. Um, and here the outcome would likely focus on some very specific issues. It might develop new ways of working, and it might provide, provide the foundation for additional work uh, going forward in the future. And that additional work may or may not include formal negotiations. Um, states parties did this in 1986 in a fairly narrow sense. Specific work was developed in the CBM format and uh, probably more relevant uh, to the current period of time in 1991 at the third review conference, which as Richard just indicated, set off the BEREX process which led to the special conference, which ultimately led to the foundation of the ad hoc group. The fourth outcome is some kind of negotiation mandate. Now you've never done this at a review conference. You've always passed the work forward in one sense, but arguably the uh, fourth review conference in 1996 endorsed the negotiation mandate that was devised by the special conference uh, and so endorsed the kind of negotiations. Now, I don't think um, the, the idea behind setting these issues or setting these outcomes um, is not to be prescriptive. There's a range of possibilities, even within those four broad kind of categories. Um, I think most of them will be recognizable to anyone who's looked at the history of the BWC. And in one sense, my view is some of the foundational issues um, need to be acknowledged and are more important going forward as we think through the next few weeks and potentially a few years. And on those foundational issues, I'm going to raise four issues. Um, the first is you cannot strengthen the convention without investing time and money. Okay? There is no way forward without additional time and additional time means additional money. Okay? And even if you go narrow, where you spend all that additional time in Geneva talking to each other, it's still gonna cost you more. Now, I'm not necessarily gonna put a figure on this, that is obviously for you as states parties to, to determine that. But I think we are reaching a, a point in time where how much time and money you as individual states parties or you collectively as BWC states parties are willing to stand, spend on this in the next few years is going to be the most significant indicator of your commitment to change. Okay. The second issue is, or the second foundational issue is, you can't go back to the protocol. Okay. You can't pick up conference room paper eight. You can't go back and look at BWC at hub group 56. Things have changed, things have moved forward. Okay. If you want to be serious, and even if your preference is for a multilaterally negotiated, legally binding verification mechanism, if you want to be serious, you have to do and begin something new. That is not to say that there aren't valuable lessons in the process of the negotiations of the ad hoc group. Just as there are valuable lessons in VEREX, in UNSCOM, in trilateral process, and in a range of other kind of 
agreement in arms control and non-arms control uh, areas. But fundamentally, going back to the protocol is not a serious proposition. And I think that needs to be clearly and clearly acknowledged. The other foundational issue here is there are no quick or simple fixes to what you are trying to do or what you would like to do. Okay, if you opt to begin a new approach, you need to be clear that this is a new multi-year process. It's not going to be easy, and it's certainly not going to be fast. And in this process, you have to work with actors well beyond states. Much of what happens in the biological area is not done by states. Some of the most important issues when we think about biological disarmament, biosafety, bio-risk management, and biosecurity issues are not directly in the purview of states. It is in the hands of other actors. And so your process must be broad enough to include actors who can learn what your concerns are, more importantly, or rather equally importantly, sorry, you can learn from the potential solutions they may have to offer from an on the ground perspective. So this process has to be inclusive if it's going to succeed going forward. My final kind of foundational point is gonna be potentially controversial, but I think it equally needs to be acknowledged. If in three weeks time, or rather six weeks time, since you're three weeks away from starting, if you fail at the ninth review conference, Biological disarmament will probably be okay. okay. The BWC has never been, and it is certainly not now, the only thing that keeps biological weapons out of the arsenals or out of the interests of either states or other, or other kinds of actors and violent actors. The convention sits within a much wider complex regime. And that regime is itself surrounded and embedded in normative constraint. Strengthening the convention is part of a larger effort to enhance biological disarmament. Much can be done outside the convention if states parties cannot reach agreement within it. So if you fail to reach agreement at this review conference, there are other routes to enhance biological disarmament and keep the world free from biological weapons as much as it is possible to do so. And these options will come into play more so than they have over the last few years if you fail. Now before you, in my opinion, is the best opportunity to move forward and strengthen the convention for over 20 years. The outcome, what you agree, is likely to determine whether the BWC is at the center of new efforts going forward, or whether it is at the sidelines and is merely a foundation of different routes and different efforts. That choice, or which happens, whatever happens, is ultimately not down to nice sounding words about commitments to biological disarmament in the BWC. It is now down to actions. And those actions will, in one sense, determine whether this convention helps move forward multilateral efforts in the biological realm, or whether the convention sits as a foundation and all the most interesting things and most valuable things happen outside the convention. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jez. I, I realise mountain time is early time as well, so thank you for getting up early to join us. I also suspect that you may have provoked some interest with your four foundational issues, and I'd be curious at a, perhaps a later stage to get a sense of the extent to which you think those other routes are multilaterally, multilateral and representative. But before that, um, I'd now like to turn to Alicia Anand. Um, Alicia is an associate researcher for the Security and Technology Programme at Unidea. Uh, before joining UNIDEA, she worked at the Ministry of External Affairs in the Government of India uh, and the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defence Studies and Analysis, as well as the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Anita is going to discuss the publication on exploring science and technology review mechanisms under the BWC. Anisha, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thank you, Jamie and Maria, for inviting me to present uh, in this timely and topical uh, meeting. Uh, hello, everyone. So as Jamie mentioned, I will, uh, in my presentation, just provide an overview of the issue of establishing an s review mechanism under the BWC, and it's based uh, on the research project Jamie and I undertook. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thanks, Vivian. Um, so since the BWC opened uh, for signature in 1972, the science and technology of relevance to the convention has advanced considerably. And there have also been considerable changes in the landscape of life sciences research uh, with a growing number of actors studying and applying biology. And at the same time, these advance, uh, advances can have both negative as well as positive implications for several articles of the BWC. So in response to these developments, BWC states parties have taken some steps uh, to better monitor these developments, uh, for example, through the intercessional process under MX2. But in our study, we argue that uh, a science-based disarmament agreement, uh, that uh, for uh, there is logic uh, uh, to have a more systematic process of in-depth assessment of science and technology. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in the study, our analyses focused on seven key aspects of a S&D review process, which is mandate and focus, selection and composition, leadership structure, ways of working, institutional to support, types of outputs, and funding. And in terms of uh, the survey uh, we conducted to gather states parties' views, uh, 42 states parties responded to the survey, and the respondents were diverse in terms of geographical representation and the range of views and positions on this issue. Uh, next, slide. next slide, please. So the, at the onset, we asked states parties, how important is the establishment of an s and review mechanism? 39 of the 42 survey respondents uh, believe that the establishment of such a mechanism is essential at, and important. However, only three survey respondents felt that this was only somewhat important or not important at all. And some suggested reasons for this included the absence of a verification mechanism and the lack of an institutional mechanism for the implementation of Article 10. So this shows that there are important connections between the s and review issue and issues concerning other articles of the BWC. Next slide, please. So for those that do support a mechanism, there are areas of divergence and convergence both in the survey and in the wider discussion on this issue. So in terms of the areas of di uh, divergence, particularly important are issues of purpose and mandate, participation and composition and institutional support. So concerning purpose and mandate, uh, our survey showed that while many uh, thought a mechanism is important, they did not necessarily agree on why it was important and what it should do. It would be advantages to build a common understanding around why states parties require review, who the review is for, and how uh, any outputs or advice will be used. This is crucial because there are important connections between the mandate of any mechanism, its structure, and the nature of its uh, participation. Now, second is the issue of participation or composition, and this is a key area of divergence. Uh, in the survey, many uh, states parties favored a limited number of participants. Uh, um, so uh, 19 survey respondents favored a group of between 10 and 30 uh, participants, but others also favored a more open-ended process uh, of science and technology review in which uh, all states parties are able to nominate an expert or experts to join uh, the discussion. There are advantages and disadvantages to both these models, and they're not uh, necessarily mutually exclusive. I will elaborate uh, on this point in a second. Um, then on the issue of institutional support, uh, um, through the survey, we found that, that while there is broad agreement uh, on the idea that additional institutional support would be required, there are diverging views on what form this should take and what uh, role uh, support staff uh, should play. Next slide, please. In terms of areas of con uh, convergence, our survey results show that there is general, uh, or sorry, broad agreement on some aspects uh, of a possible review mechanism, including um, uh, issue of the leadership structure, a possible uh, funding model, and uh, the ways of working, including uh, meeting uh, arrangements. Uh, next slide, please. So, while these uh, 
points uh, with these points in mind and building on some of the data in our report, we identified three options for states parties to consider. Our options are not prescriptive as this is a decision for states parties to make, but we thought it would be useful to put forward concrete ideas as to what a mechanism could look like. So first is uh, option is of a limited participation model uh, with some 10, 20 or 25 geographically representative, representative experts uh, selected by the states for a fixed period. Uh, this reflects the OPCW model. The second option is an open one in which any interested state party can send uh, and fund a maximum of one or two expert participants. But both the, uh, the closed and open model have advantages and disadvantages. A close participation model would have a, a stable representative set of participants who over time would develop a more nuanced understanding of the BWC and end user requirements. However, such a model may lack the flexibility to deal with a wider range of issues and bring in outside cutting edge uh, technical expertise. On the other hand, uh, an open model uh, may be more inclusive and capable of addressing a broader range of scientific questions uh, it could also facilitate knowledge transfer among states and raise uh, awareness of the convention, but such a model could complicate the process of developing actionable recommendations, and such a model may also be uh, difficult to manage. Uh, these two options are uh, sometimes presented as a binary choice, but they're not mutually exclusive. In our report, we also present the option for a hybrid review process, which would combine elements of both the open and closed uh, model. For example, uh, we could start with an open model, uh, uh, an open group that would develop a technical report, which could then be synthesized by a small uh, group of uh, experts into uh, actionable recommendations for states parties to consider. So our research proposed this uh, uh, model moving from open to close, but you could also start with a closed group of discussion before opening up the participation. Uh, the hybrid process could mitigate some of the concerns around both the open and limited uh, participation models while gaining some of the benefits of both these approaches. And some of this work has already been taken further forward by Luke Cho, who uh, I believe is also in the audience. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you uh, so much for your attention. Thank you, Alicia. Indeed, I think it is something which Ms. Georginski has taken forward as well, as well as others, including FAS, who I think I produced a working paper on this topic as well. Um, thank you for those of you adding questions. I can see there's a growing number. Um, we, we will get there soon. But before that, I'd like to turn to Maria Gazon Meseda. Uh, Maria is a research assistant with the WMD and Space Security Programs. Uh, before joining UNIDIR, Maria was a policy fellow at the European University Institute and a civil servant with the Argentine Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Maria is going to present on the UNIDIR publication on options for cooperation and assistance under Article 10 of the BWC. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, so we know Article 10 about the exchange of equipment, materials and information for peaceful purposes has long been recognized as an important issue and indeed has been a salient topic of discussion at past review conferences. And we should expect the same to happen at this review conference. But as much as it has been important, it has also been divided divisive, sorry, um, mainly in two issues. First, regarding the promotional aspect in terms of what is the scope of cooperation and capacity building. So many countries, especially from the NAM, have said that there is not enough being done. Um, and also regarding uh, the regulatory aspect. In particular, many also NAM countries have called for an end to what they see as an unfair exclusive export control regime. And their, um, the NAM Action Plan on Implementation of Article 10 includes a dispute settlement mechanism. Um, but this was seen as a step too far for other groups of states who sustain that their export controls are in line with Article 3 and that they do not hamper international cooperation and assistance. So nowadays, there are also other factors that may draw attention to Article 10 at this review conference. Um, in the pandemic, we've seen the importance of cooperation mechanisms to respond and deal with the outbreak. Um, but we have also seen competition for public health resources. And also there's uh, interest in these issues in, in the first committee uh, on the topic of peaceful purposes, right? 
So during the intercession of pro programs since the last review conference, a lot of proposals around Article 10 were aired. I recommend the working paper prepared by the chairs of MX1 where they summarized this. Um, some of these, um, rec these proposals are focused on strengthening existing measures like upgrading Article 10 database or making more of the national reporting under Article 10. Others are all more focused on implementing a dedicated structure for Article 10, like more linked to the NAM action plan. And others are standalone initiatives, like, for example, the French sec buyer proposal for a platform. Um, and others are more general about strengthening partnerships with other stakeholders. But clearly, there is a lot on the table, and many of these initiatives have been on the table for a long time, and others require maybe further development. But in any case, all of these initiatives are faced with challenges that have been recurrent in discussions on the BWC in general, as we have already heard, but also on Article 10 in particular. So to stimulate fresh thinking about this article, UNIDER has published a report, the one that we showed, that brings together ideas from a diverse range of experts on how to uh, further implement Article 10. I want to present to you a few of those ideas that build on the contributions of the authors in their respective chapters. So three concrete things that states can consider to enhance implementation of Article 10. First, we have the establishment of a voluntary fund to promote cooperation. Um, and this fund could have contributions not only from states, but also from non-state actors, including both international organizations and also private actors. In order to do this, one can take ideas from other places. There are precedents in other regimes and other places. For example, the Anti-Personal Mind Convention established a UN Voluntary Trust Fund uh, that can accept financial contributions also from the private sector, also um, in-kind secondments of experts and partnerships with private companies to supply equipment for the mining, for example. Another idea would be to undertake a systematic review of the existing cooperation. This would allow to spot gaps in the activities that are currently being conducted and could be done not only regarding the activities under the BWC itself, but also including other activities that are being conducted by other international organizations or entities. Um, and this would allow to increase coordination and create synergies that may help reduce costs and improve the effectiveness of collective efforts in this regard. Um, and this review effort could also be directed at surveying states to better identify what are their priorities and explore in detail what are the problems that they are facing regarding cooperation. The third idea would be to establish a, a cooperation entity with the purpose of better understanding and responding to the challenges related to Article 10. And this entity could take various forms. It could be a working group or a committee, if it's not the cooperation committee that was discussed in the protocol negotiation and it's reiterated in the NAM action plan. Um, and this would consist of representatives of state parties. But it could also take the form of a group of technical experts that are appointed in their personal capacities. This would be more similar perhaps to a scientific advisory board. Um, or it could even be an agenda or a designated component of a new intercessional work program or something else entirely that state bodies come up with. But this entity, whatever form it takes, could receive a mandate that is solely focused on performing some kind of a systematic review, as we uh, described previously, um, and recommend state bodies what are the possible measures that they could take to address uh, the national and the systemic issues that impede international cooperation. Of course, this would be a compromise with an NAM position of including a dispute settlement body. Um, there are many other ideas in the report, including to use Article 10 to foster track two relations or use it as a vehicle for cooperation around education and awareness raising activities, for example. Um, but just two seconds more before I finish. Um, by saying that the challenge to pro progress in this area has been twofold. On one side, there are political challenges that we've already heard, the reciprocal recriminations that were mentioned. 
But on the other side, there are systemic challenges also to cooperation. And while the review conference can solve these systemic challenges in three weeks, what it can do is set in motion a systemic process to address these challenges. The proposals that I've just mentioned can be taken into consideration, for example, establishing a voluntary fund or providing technical assessment of the challenges uh, to Article 10 or making more of national reports. All of these could be helpful if countries wish to put forward an acceptable package of measures that includes international cooperation issues. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to comments and questions. Thank you, Maria. I, I think the paper you referred to earlier as well by a collection of states is working paper number six, which is available on the, the all new look UNODA meetings place website. Um, I now want to turn to off the floor to Daniel Feeks, who is the, the head of the implementation support unit of the Biological Weapons Convention within the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs in Geneva. Uh, Daniel, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Jamie. Good morning, afternoon, evening to um, to you wherever you are as well. Um, well, so first of all, thanks, Jamie, and to the organisers to Unidir for the invitation to to speak to everyone today, and and thanks particularly to Unidir for all of the work to prepare people for the review conference to organise these kinds of events, um, to publish the reports that uh, have just been discussed, and the work that you've been doing on the BWC in general for the last few years, in fact, and and also your participation in our recent regional preparatory meetings, as well. I think this is a, a big difference in the run up to this particular review conference as compared to, to previous ones. Um, in contrast to, to the other speakers, I haven't got a, a pitch, I haven't written a report, or I don't have any grand ideas about the substantive issues to be considered at the review conference. But what I did want to do is to um, take up Jamie's offer to speak briefly about institutional issues. So I'll take a few minutes to do that. And then obviously, I'm also happy to respond to any questions, comments that, that may come up later on. So the first thing I wanted to do is to note that the BWC is set up differently to many other treaties and entities in that there are no permanent BWC institutions. Even each review conference itself decides that the next one should take place. The BWC itself only makes reference in its Article 12 to the very first review conference, although recent review conferences have decided that review conferences should take place at least every five years. So beyond the fact that there are no permanent or continuing institutions, the intercessional programs consisting of meetings of experts, meetings of states parties and the implementation support unit, as they have in recent years, also have to be renewed by each review conference. Um, I know it's obvious, I know many people know this already, but I feel that I have to make this, this point at the beginning, as we regularly receive questions from delegates and from our colleagues within the UN um, here in Geneva asking, for example, when are the dates for next year's BWC meetings? Or what's the budget for next year's meetings? Or when will the invoices be sent for next year? Obviously, at this particular stage, we can't answer any of these questions until the review conference itself has taken place. All of these issues, all of these questions are dependent on decisions to be taken at the review conference. Now, in theory, it could be possible that the review conference takes no decisions at all and therefore, from the 1st of January next year, there will be no more annual meetings, there will be no more implementation support unit, maybe only a review conference five years from now. So unlike other institutions, for example, the OPCW, the IAEA, the CTBTO, and many other international regimes, the continuation of the current BWC institutions cannot be taken for granted. It will require consideration, discussion, and decisions at this upcoming review conference. So I'm, I'm here not trying to state the obvious, but given, as I mentioned, the questions that we do receive regularly from people within um, UN at Geneva and also from delegations, it seems to be a point that, that I should make here at the beginning. Um, now, moving on, obviously, the shape, the format, the duration, the scope, and so on of any future intercessional program and the, the, the institutional kind of structure of the BWC for the next five years as an issue for states parties and for discussion and decision at the review conference itself. It's important that such issues are considered at the same time as the more substantive issues and that these kinds of more administrative, um, you know, financial issues are not just an afterthought. It's also important that careful thought is given to how any future intercessional program will actually function in reality. 
This is going to require a delicate balance between ambition and resources. But if the ambition is what it appears to be in the statements that we've heard from many states parties in recent years, it will clearly require more financial resources, as um, Jez said in his um, intervention earlier. On this, I'd like to refer briefly to the ISU background paper on financial implications that we um, produced a few months ago now. That's document BWC slash conf dot Roman nine slash PC slash four. Um, and in there, it provides information on finances and also some extrapolations and kind of scenarios um, for the costs of um, various future proposals as well. So hopefully it will be collective ambition that will be the determining factor in this balance, not resources. For example, in the previous intersessional program, we saw a mismatch between the tasks and the topics that were given, for example, to MX3 on national implementation and the meeting of states parties themselves and the time allowed for those meetings. Meaning that, for example, in the 2019 meeting of experts on national implementation, it was unable to even complete discussion of all the items on its agenda in the six hours allocated to it. And that each year, the MSPs were unable to properly consider the reports of the meetings of experts that were submitted to them, and that were one of the main functions of the meetings of states parties. And similarly, if any new tasks or mandates are to be assigned to the implementation support unit, they will also need to be properly resourced. So the final point I wanted to make is about finances themselves. Now, nobody, I think I'm right in saying, likes to talk about finances. Um, when I arrived in this post a few years ago, I certainly didn't imagine that finances would be such an important and dominant element of the job as it has been for so long now with the discussions that we've been having. But the reality is that everything that happens does cost something. We've seen in the past intersessional program that some states parties have not paid in full and on time, and we've seen the impact that can have on the intersessional program through reductions in meetings and services for the meetings, particularly interpretation and translation, and also um, causing a lack of stability affecting planning and sustainability for the overall program. Even now with the BWC's most important meeting since 2016, only three weeks away, as the president designate has often reminded states parties, we have still not received all of last year's payments, which were due on the 1st of January 2021, despite the efforts of the president designate, the Office for Disarmament Affairs, us in the Implementation Support Unit and UN Geneva. And the other reality is that to improve something, whether it's through additional meetings, longer meetings, more tasks for the ISU, negotiations, or whatever it may be, that will require a larger budget for the BWC as a whole. Now, the good news on this is that for the vast majority of states parties, their current payments to the BWC are actually very small. As we pointed out in our background paper, almost two thirds of states parties pay less than $1,000 per year. 54 states parties pay less than $100 per year and 26 pay less than $20 per year. So throughout the intersessional program and also at the PrepCom earlier this year, many states parties have spoken in favor of strengthening the BWC. So hopefully it's now well established that to strengthen something requires additional resources and hopefully states parties are well prepared for discussions and decisions on these institutional issues at the upcoming review conference. Thanks very much, Jamie. Back to you. Thank you, Daniel. Indeed, thank you to all the speakers for the presentations and comments. Uh, it would be remiss here if I didn't mention some of the work that Dr. Renata Hesman de la Croix has led in relation to gender of biological weapons, in particular work she has done on the gender consequences of a biological attack and the implications for the provision of assistance under Article 7. So I did want to note that. And also to mention that with, and I believe this is correct, please forgive me if I've missed any country name, but with Australia, the BWC ISU, the European Union, Panama, Philippines, Sweden, and Unity are actually organizing an event on gender equality in the BWC, which will take place on the 17th of November at quarter past one in room 27. Uh, with that in mind, I now want to turn to some of the questions that we've received from the audience. I'm going to try and cluster these in around three topics that we've had questions on so far. And the first one of these kind of there's two questions which really link to outcomes. And I'll open this up to you first, Jez, if I may. But one question here on how feasible do panelists think it is to get agreement on the expert working group proposed by Canada and the Netherlands to evolve the intersessional process? 
and kind of linked with this, how could the review conference lead to an ambitious progress in terms of institutional strengthening the convention as a priority, taking into consideration the growing challenges? Perhaps, Jez, if I can put that one to you first, the floor's yours. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I mean, in terms of Will Working Paper 2, I think it is a Canada Netherlands paper and its co-sponsors. Um, I don't think anyone's expecting that everyone else in the room is going to go, oh, thanks, guys. That's that's one task we can tick up straight away. That's that's taken care of. But, you know, when you when I look at that paper in terms of let's set up some specific meetings on some focus topics, there's a time frame on it. And this is what we should do, uh, including dealing with potentially difficult issues and having difficult discussions. <clears throat> I think that is the landing zone, for want of a better term, where when you look at national statements from other participants, other states parties talking about focus working, working groups, open-ended work, or moving back towards certain things, I think there is this kind of common area where we can see working groups are probably the likely response to the current challenges. Um, so I don't think you know, anyone's gonna take working paper two and wrap it in a bow and say, that's great, that's taken care of. But I do think it's a good kind of foundation for the discussions. In terms of the institutional issues, I mean, Daniel's kind of laid out very clearly something we all know, for those of us who follow the BWC. It might be time, in my view, um, since I often think, you know, my, my thinking on the BWC is thinking, Come 2025, this thing is 50 years old. We need to renew it in some shape or form. So like the BWC beyond 50, for want of a better phrase. It might be time at this review conference to say, right, what do we need to be a normal institutional basis? We need an ISU, or we need some people looking after this. Uh, we need the website, the CBM formats, et cetera and maybe begin to understand that we are spending this money and these are our commitments, regardless of what we decide to do in the future in terms of workload. And then add on, okay, what are the funding, what are the time commitments we need for any new specific tasks we are setting ourselves in the next one, two, five years. So it may be time to move away from this kind of hand-to-mouth review conference to review conference approach and take a decision that says, we've been here for nearly 50 years, we want to be here for the next 50 years, so this are the minimum, these are the minimal institutional and funding requirements we are going to put in place to give this thing the future and the background. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. Uh, I have a question related to uh, stakeholder roles, which I'm going to put to you shortly, Richard, but also please feel free to follow up on that. If others in the panel want to respond to that, so Tancredi, if, if you'd like to take the floor, please wave a virtual hand or a real one at me as you see fit. Uh, before that, perhaps, Richard, there's questions on civil society. Uh, how can civil society parties help during the review conference to encourage strengthening the convention? And then how is coordination between actors around the BWC and other institutions such as the WHO currently institutionalized? Are there regular meetings? Perhaps, Daniel, it's something you want to, to raise as well. But Richard, the floor is yours first. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd see those two questions as being pretty closely related. Um, and that is, um, this is something that I, I think both uh, Jez and I referred to in our presentations as well, the need to involve stakeholders other than, than states because dealing with biological risks and the threat of biological weapons is something that's now well beyond the capability of, of governments on their own. Uh, and that's been recognized for a time. And I think, I think one of the big achievements of the first intercessional process that took place following the, the resumed Fifth Review Conference in 2002 um, was, I mean, that big achievement of that process was to bring in a number of, of uh, other stakeholders and to improve the connections between the BWC and, for example, the World Health Organization, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, uh, Interpol, um, um, Academies of Science, uh, representative bodies of a scientific community, um, and many others. So I think, you know, in terms of how can uh, civil society help the review conference, um, firstly, they can 
I hope provide some substantive input themselves in terms of ideas, uh, data and uh, suggestions for, for what governments should do. Uh, also ideas on how they can cooperate with governments and what they can bring to the table in terms of dealing with the risks of biological weapons. Um, that may be very practical things, it may be more theoretical things, it could be research, it could be um, hosting conferences, activities, workshops, uh, many different ways that civil society can contribute. Um, and I think the, the converse of that is that uh, states parties should be open and uh, in fact active in encouraging civil society and other stakeholders to, to get involved with the BWC process. Now, whether that's through a revised intercessional process or through some other mechanism, I don't think it matters very much as long as the, the outcome is that um, there's more engagement, more dialogue, more interaction between um, governments and these, these other stakeholders um, dealing with some of the issues that, that we've discussed so far this afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. I can see Maria and then Tancredi. And I think that's the order hands were raised. So please, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeremy. I just wanted um, to briefly pitch a UNIDIR activity. <laughs> um, so as, as it was said, states no longer do this uh, by themselves. And uh, we are looking into facilitating relations between industry, academia uh, uh, on one hand, and then state bodies on the other. And we're putting together actually a, a, a new report on stakeholders' views on the BWC, including what they are doing, what more could they do uh, in the implementation of the BWC? Um, what states should do to strengthen the BWC and in relation to, to stakeholder engagement? Um, so, so we're including academia, industry, DIY bio communities, um, a lot of different stakeholders that may not be formally linked to the BWC, but conduct activities that are relevant to it. So we hope to, to have this report um ready by the review conference uh, and, and, uh, and that is of interest to all of our audience. Okay, thank you, Maria. We do have some questions on science and then a question whether we are joking on the budget figures provided. Um, we, we are not, uh, but Tancredi, the floor is yours, first of all. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I will simply comment on the civil society question because I believe it's uh, very relevant. And uh, I'll start saying that um, civil society, well, as, as a wide concept, uh, is already engaged in the preparation for the review conference. Um, the contribution from civil society is not only appreciated, but also needed for us to prepare for the review conference uh, in terms of scientific contribution, but also to policy debate. And even if, of course, the, the BWC and the review conference itself, it's, a, it's an interstate process, I believe that the, the, the participation of the civil society can uh, add value to our work and certainly, certainly will be the case also at the next review conference. But just uh, um, in, in a line uh, to summarize, I would say that uh, this participation goes um, beyond the, the informal part of the, Rev, you know, the, of the REVCON that is usually devoted to participation of civil society. The REVCON is a three weeks event, and there are many uh, opportunities to interact with the states, with the delegates, with the office holders, uh, not only in the six hours per day official meetings. And those are the opportunities where we need to really make the best of our connections uh, with civil society, with all the stakeholders, uh, as we uh, usually do between state parties. Thank you, Tancredi. And uh, Daniel, please, the floor is yours. I, I, just before you start, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I don't expect people to stay, but with your interest, we'll can go for a little bit further if people do want to keep going. There's one sort of questions I want to get to. Uh, but please, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, yeah, I just wanted to come in on the issue, the question that was raised about WHO. I mean, WHO has been involved in issues relating to biological and, and to chemical weapons since at least I think the late 1960s, I think I'm right in saying. Um, and, and they are very much involved in, in BWC as well. I mean, WHO always attends BWC meetings that take place here in Geneva, the official ones. They are um, very active in some of the working level and the more technical meetings that we organize here in Geneva. 
and in various countries around the world as well. So we, we do indeed have a very close working relationship with, um, with the World Health Organization and also I should say with the World Animal Health Organization and also the Food and Agriculture Organization as well because the BWC, we should remember, does not just cover um, use of disease as a weapon against humans but also against animals and plants as well. Um, and yes, on as Jamie said, on the budget issue, no, we are not joking. The overall budget for the BWC per year is around about 1.5 million and that's spread between the 184 states parties to the convention. Um, one observer of BWC issues has compared the annual budget to the BW, for the BWC to the average annual um, budget of a, a regular McDonald's restaurant. I'm not quite sure about that comparison, but just to give you an idea of roughly how, how little is spent um, on the Biological Weapons Convention compared with the, the risks and the issues faced and also compared with other um, treaties and regimes, particularly dealing with weapons of mass destruction. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, just to note, other fast food providers are available as well. Uh, I should also add, just from outside, the WHO global guidance overlaps with some of the work that's been undertaken in the BWC as well. Now, we have a question about science and technology, which relates to a particular experiment uh, with an 80% lethality kill rate, questioning why are scientists allowed to do this? As, it's, as the, uh, the commenter points out, it's obviously dangerous. Um, is bio-research still a wild west? And then kind of linked with this on the S&T side is how would cloud computing and cloud computing security apply within the BWC regime? Does anybody want to take this? I mean, I have some thoughts on this. Uh, Alicia, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, on the first question regarding uh, why uh, scientists are allowed to do this, I think uh, in my presentation, I noted that uh, the life sciences research uh, landscape is changing very fast. And there are new actors like the DIY bio community that are uh, engaging in life sciences uh, research. So of course, uh, the policy community is um, about taking some some time to kind of match up with the pace of uh, how the biosecurity life sciences research is advancing. But I do also want to say that the community itself is also developing their own codes of conduct to ensure that uh, life sciences uh, research is done responsibly. For example, the Tangine uh, guidelines, uh, the code of conduct uh, uh, between uh, the uh, Tangine University and uh, the John Hopkins University is one, one example. Uh, uh, of that. And of course, having a review mechanism within the BWC would allow the BWC to be to systematically monitor developments in science and technology and to ensure that the policy um, community is uh, at pace with how fast uh, uh, the landscape is changing. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, okay. I certainly echo some of those points as well. We we did have a question to panelists on why is nobody addressing the elephant in the room? This relates to accusations um, that we've heard recently in relation to Article 5 and been raised in then Article 6 as well. Um, I don't know whether anybody wants to take these, and I ask with a certain degree of trepidation, because, yeah, Richard, please, the floor's yours. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I think I did address this particular elephant uh, in my initial presentation, but perhaps uh, the question I wasn't here at the beginning. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is important that, that uh, we don't shy away from this, and I can assure you that, the, that at least the Russian Federation will, will not let anyone forget about it at the review conference. So, uh, but certainly from the point of view of the paper I was presenting and the question of compliance and verification, the, the uh, accusations that Russia have made are a very good illustration of why we need much better and more developed um, mechanisms to deal with uh, non-compliance allegations. And it really doesn't matter what you think about these particular uh, allegations from Russia. I mean, in fact, the more controversial they are, the, the better the, the point is made that we really need a, a trusted and impartial mechanism to, to deal with these kinds of things. Uh, and the fact that this has happened so close to the review conference, I think, is, is actually a, a good thing and that it, it means that everybody will have it fresh in their minds and be focusing on it as something that needs to be, be dealt with. Whether it will be dealt with successfully uh, to everyone's satisfaction, I, I doubt, but uh, nonetheless, it's there and um, it's really the role of the Convention as a whole to, to confront exactly these kinds of issues. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Daniel, is that a, a fresh hand you want to take this point? 
That's yeah, awesome. I, I mean, just very briefly on the same thing, just to remind everyone um, that, you know, of course, we had a, a formal consultative meeting under Article 5 on, on exactly this issue um, just a, a month or two ago here in Geneva as well. So as, as Richard said in his um, remarks earlier, you know, mechanisms, provisions of the BWC have been have been used, have been activated as well. So, um, so yeah, just wanted to make that that very brief point as well. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you both for taking on that particular elephant. It's very much appreciated. And on that note, I'd suggest we actually bring this discussion to a close. We are slightly over time, uh, but I really do want to thank all of you, all the panelists that have joined us today, um, both those of Unity authors, uh, Jez, Richard, Alicia, and Maria, but also Tancredi and uh, Daniel as well. So thank you really very much for taking the time. Also, thanks to our Unity team that helped produce this, uh, particularly Vivian Zhang and Manon Blanchfort, who are joining us as well. And thank Thank you to all those of you in the audience um, for sticking with us. We've still got about 165 people still here, so we're very grateful for you joining. Uh, we hope this was useful. Um, there are some links in the chat as well to some of the publications if people want to follow up on these issues. And just a reminder, again, there will be an event next Thursday on gender equality in the BWC, which will be led by my colleague uh, Renata and, and other um, actors as well, including our colleagues from the ISU. Just before I do close, I'd invite you all, please do fill out the online feedback form. It is very short, it's anonymous, and it can help us in moving, moving sort of improving our events. Uh, there should be a link to this in the chat window, so please do feel free to use it. And really, thank you all for joining us today. Um, if we can be of any help moving forward as we get closer and closer to the review conference, then I think collectively we're probably all happy to speak on this topic. So I think um, do, do get in touch. Um, otherwise, um, we wish you all the best in your preparations. We hope to see you there in a couple of weeks and have a good day, night, or depending on where this finds you. Thank you very much. Thank you.